With the increased core count and frequency upgrades, referring to next generation custom silicon like M2 and M3, Apple has a good chance to overtake Intel in the PC space. I'm Renee Ritchie, thanks to CuriosityStream and Nebula for sponsoring. Now, let's react to this. And yeah, that's more than a little wonky because Apple Silicon Roadmap isn't just about core counts and frequencies any more than Intel's is just about goosing voltage. But before we get into what we already know about M2 and why M3 might be just another major leap forward, let's address the elephant-sized silicon in the room. You know, our stumbles, you know, Apple decided they could do a better chip themselves than we could. I would hope to win back this piece of their business. No. More realistically here. We also want to win them to more of our foundry offerings over time. And yes, sure, there are geopolitical arguments and personally, I just love to see more chips being fabbed in North America, but that's gonna be an incredibly tough win for Intel because TSMC is already on their second generation five nanometer process and they are just driving like speed force fast towards three nanometers and more on both of those in a quantum realm minute. And that's all the while Intel is still trying to stick their landing on their 10 let's rebrand it as seven nanometer process. And secondly, the way Intel seems intent on wooing Apple is through the lamest, most ratioed attack ads imaginable. And I mean, the last one made me cringe so hard, I almost pulled a hammy. So shut up and ship. Let your silicon, let your process do the talking, which is what Apple's been focusing on, including A15, which some benchmark LARPers claimed was proof positive Apple had hit a brick wall and was suffering from a brain drain, but which turned out to be just full of silicon surprises. And I've done a whole entire explainer on A15 already. And you better believe I have an M1 Pro and M1 Max explainer on the way as well. Hit the subscribe button so you don't miss it. And that's important because M1 was based on A14 generation IP. Ice storm efficiency cores, firestorm performance cores, not that firestorm, G13 graphics cores, the whole bit. But M2, especially if it comes out in the next six to nine months, M2 will almost certainly be based on A15 generation IP. Blizzard efficiency cores, not that Blizzard, Avalanche performance cores, G14 graphics cores, and more. Now, the information in Wayne Ma, they don't actually say that much about M2, at least not compared to M3, which I'll get to in just a PIM particle process shrunk second. But what they do say is that M2 will be fabbed on TSMC's upgraded plussed out five nanometer process, which makes absolutely the kind of sense that does given A15 is already on the N5P node and that there'll be a single die version codenamed Staten in the upcoming MacBook Air redesign, but that there'll be a dual die version as well. And I just covered the potential of dual and quad die versions in the next Mac Pro. So I'll link that below the like button as well. Now. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman has also reported that M2 will stick with four E cores and four P cores, but increase the GPU core count from seven or eight to nine or 10, where the M1's E cores and P cores were a song of ice and fire, just with a way, way better ending. M2's double up on cold, like Mr. Freeze level cold, not that Mr. Freeze. And the Avalanche performance cores, other than running at eight to 10% higher frequencies and having double the system cache, have also increased the L2 cache size by half again. And taken together, it just makes the performance cores much, much more efficient, 17% more efficient at peak states. At the same time, the Blizzard efficiency cores are also offering much better performance, up to 23% better. The G14 graphics cores are a little more complicated ranging from just under 20 to just over 50% faster, but there are four and five core variants now and throttling from the iPhone's very, very small thermal envelope. But we end up with what Anantech calls astonishing peak performance, well above Apple's marketing claims and large improvements to efficiency as well. Are you getting it? Performance and efficiency of that magnitude are absolutely important for a thermal envelope the size of the iPhone 13. But it just so happens to also be important for the ultra low power fanless computers like the upcoming even more airier MacBook Air, where the current version gets stupefying battery life, but does ramp down frequencies on sustained heavy loads of like 10 to 20 minutes or more. So a cooler M2 in a cooler, lighter MacBook Air chassis would be just Ella cool, better performance than M1, especially on the E cores and most especially on the GPU cores, but with even better efficiency as well for the same, maybe even slightly better battery life. Yes, please. And who knows, just like M1 Pro and Max have those A15 style media engines already built in, merged like Devastator or Voltron, depending on where your particular franchise loyalties lie, 
Maybe M2 Pro and Max will have some hybrid A16 features built in as well, because why should iPhone 14 get all the fun? And just like Apple went from TSMC's seven nanometer process on the A13 to five nanometers on the A14 and M1, they're reportedly gonna be going to three nanometers on the A16 and the M3 as well, which yes, doesn't just start to sound subatomically small, but almost comically small. Wayne says it'll debut in a future iPad Pro before going into a future MacBook Air, which maybe, but Apple works at least three years out on their silicon. So what I'm saying is expect M3 when and in what you see it. But basically a process shrink just means you can fit the same amount of transistors into a smaller space, which increases efficiency or even more transistors into the same amount of space, which increases performance or a little bit of both increasing a little bit of both. So that'll be a huge advantage for Apple again, just right out of the gate. And at the same time, Apple is also widely expected to be adopting ARM's next generation instruction set architecture or ISA. ARM V9. Now, some people are expecting more, better, big gains from that as well. And yes, I would absolutely love to see that, but Apple's largely been driving ARM since V8 and ARM 64, and I don't think that's changed. So my read is V9 looks like ARM's way of backporting a lot of what Apple's already been doing over the last half decade or so, standardizing it and making it available to all of their other licensees. So aside from some matrix multiplication boosts, which assuredly aren't nothing, I just don't think it'll matter anywhere nearly as much to Apple. What all that breaks down to is M2 for the 2022 MacBook Air and M3 for the 2023 MacBook Air and whether Apple makes new Pro and Max versions of every M series system on a chip or just alternates like they did with the A10X and A12X with no A11X or A13X, I'll dive into that in a follow-up video. So seriously, hit subscribe. But either way, anyway, this type of rampant escalation in generational IP, process shrinks, core counts, and now die counts, this multi-vector attack on all the old preconceptions about what levels of power could be reached using so little power is gonna make it really hard for Intel or anyone to match, at least for a while. And the really cool thing, the really, really cool thing is that Apple's already told us just exactly how they're gonna be doing it all. They said it out loud during my talk with the VP of Custom Silicon. And you can listen to the extended version of it with both him and the VP of Mac Product Marketing ad-free and sponsor-free on Nebula. Because that's where I post all of my videos, including extended versions of my interviews, reviews, and explainers, and my exclusive documentary on the original iPhone. There was no question that was a game-changer phone. That was ahead of its time. We're gonna make some history together today. The iPhone really I mean, it has changed I mean, my life in so many ways. All on Nebula where I have the luxury of making videos that don't have to be optimized for YouTube at all, but for you, the nerdiest, most hardcore of you will just absolutely love them. All ad-free, sponsor-free, on Nebula, bundled in for free when you sign up with today's sponsor at curiositystream.com slash Richie, or just click the link below. And right now, because you're watching this video, you can get CuriosityStream for 26% off less than 15 bucks a year, less than the price of your least favorite Mac dongle for a whole entire year. And that includes their thousands of amazing documentaries and series like Particle Fever, which follows six brilliant scientists during the launch of the Large Hadron Collider, the biggest and most expensive experiment in the history of planet Earth. It's the best way to support educational creators directly and just the best damn deal in streaming today. For over 26% off CuriosityStream, less than 15 bucks a year, and Nebula bundled in for free. Just click the button on the screen or go to curiositystream.com slash Renee Clicking on that button really helps out the channel and so does hitting the playlist above for more, much more on the M1, M1 Pro, M1 Max, and what's coming next. Just hit up that playlist and I'll see you in the next video.